on Kira before we get started. <laughs> So Kira is a registered dietitian currently working in diabetes here in Kamloops, BC. Well, I guess here for myself, uh, the primary care clinic um, and the heart health, um, heart health program through the vascular Impro improvement program. Prior to these roles, she worked at the hospital for in a number of settings for almost five years. She has completed her bachelor of science in nutrition and food science and accredited diet, uh, diet sorry, dietetic internship at University of Alberta in 2017. She has been working in Kamloops since then. Her goals as a dietitian are to help people make sustainable, healthy, and enjoyable changes in their diet and lifestyle that have a positive impact on their health and quality of life. Outside of work, she enjoys spending time with her dog, and you can find her on mountain biking, paddle boarding, cross-country skiing, downhill skiing or backcountry skiing. So she likes the outdoors. <laughs> um, so welcome Kira, and we're looking forward to your talk. Uh, just a couple things to note. Um, the presentation will be about 30 minutes and then we'll leave a lot of time at the end to allow for any questions and um, that Kira can help answer. Um, so just I'll, we ask is to keep yourself muted till the end um, and then we can get you guys to unmute, ask your questions or if you wanna uh, type them into the um, question box on the side, then we can read them at the end. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's all for now and we will get going and just make sure you guys are all on mute. And just a reminder everybody, the presentation is being recorded and will be posted um, after a little bit later today, if you wanna view it afterwards, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Here. All oh. yours. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, too. Um, yeah, so we'll just chat about kind of nutrition for lung health, COPD, asthma today. Um, and yeah, I think I'm one of those weird people that really likes the snow and was quite happy it snowed last night here. So hopefully I have a few more people on my side like that. Um, so here's the presentation. Um, yeah, so just talking about nutrition for COPD and asthma. Here, I'm just going to share a different screen. One second. Okay. So what we're going to cover today, um, we'll talk about the connection between nutrition and breathing. Um, and we'll talk about just generally like what is healthy eating. Um, we'll review like the healthy fats. We'll talk about sodium, how that relates to everything. Um, we'll touch a bit on processed foods, talk about kind of water, fluid, and then supplements. So vitamins, minerals, things like that. Um, so how are nutrition and breathing connected? So good nutrition helps us to have more energy. Um, it helps us to have more strength. It can help manage any other health conditions we might have. So whether that's high blood pressure, problems with cholesterol, diabetes, so kind of all the other areas that I work in. Um, and then as well, our bodies use food as fuel and the right mix of nutrients can help it make, help it be easier for us to breathe. So it really is important, even though it might not seem like they're directly connected. Um, and as far as the impact of nutrition, so diet really can either increase or decrease our risk of lifestyle related diseases and choosing the right foods can help decrease this risk. So following a healthy diet can help us to feel better, have more energy and live longer. So what is healthy eating? And really it is no single factor. It's a mixture of a number of different things. And so we look at meal spacing and that would be like how far apart you're eating, when you're eating, whether you're having snacks or you're not. Um, it encompasses balanced meals and we'll touch more on kind of what that is. Um, really it includes eating lots of fruits and vegetables. Um, choosing whole grain foods the majority of the time, and then trying to pick the more heart healthy fats. 
Um, and just kind of a caveat before we dive into this a bit, research really shows that, you know, what we do most of the time has the biggest impact on our health. So the goal is to try to choose healthy foods most of the time, and we're aiming for about 80% here. And this still allows us to have some indulgences and less healthy foods some of the time. And we aim for about 20% of that. So I know often I see patients in diabetes who come in and tell me, oh, I like just had a lady tell me that she hadn't had any, a single piece of cake or a dessert in six months. And, you know, she was really proud of herself, but was like, how can I keep doing this moving forward? And the good news is you don't have to, we don't have to eat perfectly all the time. It's not sustainable. It's not realistic and it's not very fun. So, you know, heading into the Christmas season and the festive season where there's lots more treats, things like that, there is certainly room to have these as part of our diet. And um, as long as we're trying to make the healthy choice most of the time is really the important thing there. So when we talk about meal spacing, the goal is to have meals and snacks no more than about four to five hours apart. And this helps us to digest food better. It helps prevent bloating and discomfort. You know, it helps gives our bodies um, like a kind of constant stream of energy. So it helps our bodies conserve energy. And that way we're not breaking down our muscles or our other tissues in order to fuel ourselves. And it also just helps us maintain balanced nutrition and get the things in that we need to eat. So what is a balanced meal? And really the goal is for a meal to include foods from at least three of the food groups. Um, so the food groups would be vegetables and fruit, dairy and alternatives, meat and alternatives, and grain products. And yeah, so typically we want to choose for our meals at least foods from three of these groups, four if possible, but not necessary. Um, and a way that we can do this is the healthy plate method. And this is where we aim to have about half of our plate or half of our meal be vegetables or fruit. We want about a quarter of our plate or a quarter of our meal to be the protein and then the other quarter to be the starch. And the goal here is definitely to choose whole grains and unrefined kind of starch foods more often. So you can see in here, there's like, here's a slice of like whole wheat bread. They've got a wild rice, they've got some quinoa. And those are definitely the things we wanna choose more often compared to those whiter, more refined kind of foods. Um, and, you know, the source of protein or that, you know, meat and alternatives food group, it really encompasses a lot of different foods. So it's not just meat. Um, and you can see here, they've got lots of examples. So like nuts and seeds count as a source of protein, um, Greek yogurt counts, cottage cheese or other hard cheeses, eggs, tofu, fish. So there's lots of foods that can be eaten as protein sources. And like, if you don't like meat, you don't have to eat it by, by any means. And then as far as vegetables and fruit, really this would mean like any non-starchy vegetable. So something like a potato would fit more into that starch category rather than in the vegetables. Um, yeah. And you know, as far as kind of sources of vegetables, this can be fresh, frozen, or canned. It does not have to be fresh by any means. And I know just with the cost of food and everything these days, it can be really hard to afford, you know, fresh produce. So frozen, canned are equally good options. And, you know, if you're getting canned foods, um, Try to look for ones canned without salt or low salt if possible, but if, if all you can find is like a regular can of canned beans, let's say, a way that you can remove some of that extra salt would be to drain the can and then rinse it really well with water and that'll take some of that extra salt off. So it can be just as healthy. So I do want to really make the point that healthy eating, you know, I know food is very expensive right now, but there are ways to do it that, you know, you don't have to break the bank eating healthy. So the other piece we talk about is snacks and snacks, 
you know, snacking gets a bad rap, but it's really not a bad thing. And, you know, if you find yourself hungry at some point between, say, breakfast and lunch or between lunch and dinner, you know, that's a great time to have a snack and to feed yourself. And it's important to listen to those hunger cues and, you know, feed yourself when you are hungry. And when we're talking about a balanced snack, it's a similar idea to a meal. And we want to include foods from at least two of the food groups. So whether that's fruits and vegetables, dairy and alternatives, meat and alternatives, or green products. And here are some examples. So a healthy snack could be like an apple and peanut butter. It could be vegetables and hummus. It could be something as simple as cheese and crackers or a peanut butter sandwich. You could do yogurt and fruit, cottage cheese and berries, grapes and almonds, banana and almond butter. Really anything that you like that includes kind of two different food groups is a good balanced snack to have. So as far as kind of fruits and vegetables and, you know, a healthy diet really emphasizes a lot of fruits and vegetables. And the reason for this is because these foods provide us with so much fiber, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and other nutrients that are really good for us. Um, as well, fiber helps keep us full longer. So, you know, it's helpful if you're worried that you might be overeating to try and have a bit more fruits and vegetables. Um, and we know from the research that higher fruit and vegetable intake is associated with a lower heart disease risk. So it's definitely a good thing from that perspective. Um, and the way you can do this is just aim to fill half of your plate or half of your meal with vegetables or fruit. And sometimes it can help to fill up this part of your plate first before going for, say, like the meat or the mashed potatoes or something like that. Um, and then you can have fruit or vegetables as part of your snacks. So that's another way to get them in. Um, and it's always best to choose fruit instead of juice. Um, just because juice doesn't have any of that fiber in there that we really like. So, um, it, you know, it can be a good way to get some vitamin C or get some different things in, but it doesn't have all the benefits that just eating fruit would give you. Um, and some people worry about kind of the sugar content of fruit. Um, and I want to say that we really aren't too concerned about this, even in kind of the world of diabetes, which I work in. Um, because fruit has so much fiber and so many other good things, it's not a bad thing to eat. And that sugar really doesn't have a huge impact on blood sugars if that's something you're concerned about. So, you know, don't feel the need to limit fruit. Um, so as far as whole grains, a whole grain is a carbohydrate food that has not been processed or it's been minimally processed. And really the goal is to choose these foods most often because they contain more fiber, which as we know, helps keep us full. It helps balance out blood sugars. And then it also helps to lower our cholesterol. So fiber is definitely a good thing to have. Whole grains also have a bit more protein, which we know helps keep us full. It helps stabilize blood sugars. And it's gonna have more vitamins and minerals than your refined or like white carbohydrate products. So yeah, they're definitely good things to choose whenever you can. And you know, maybe if you don't like whole wheat pasta, there are some other options out there too. Like you can get these um, smart pastas they're called and they're like pastas that have fiber added back into them. And that's definitely a better option than just your typical white pasta. So, you know, there's lots of little workarounds like this and the food industry has been able to come up with a lot of good healthy products that, you know, people can eat maybe if they don't like whole grains. So yeah, those are just some other options to consider. And then when we look at fats, we really want to try to choose heart healthy fats. And these would be the unsaturated fats. So these fats are typically a liquid at room temperature, um, but they could also be found in like nuts and seeds. Um, and these fats have been shown to help lower that LDL cholesterol or the lousy cholesterol that we don't want to be high. Um, so there's lots of sources of them, but you could use canola oil, olive oil, peanut oil, any of those non-hydrogenated margarines or like the tub margarine, those are good ones, um, avocados, nuts and seeds. Um, and the goal really is to choose these foods most often, especially when you're choosing a source of fat or like a cooking oil to use. 
And then as far as the fats we want to avoid, these would be your saturated fats. And these are typically a solid at room temperature. And a reason to avoid these is that they raise that LDL cholesterol or that lousy cholesterol. So some examples would be like butter, coconut oil, palm oil, the white fat that you can see in a piece of meat. Um, and then it's also present in like higher fat or whole fat dairy products. And we do want to limit these foods and try to choose them least often. Um, so a question that I get quite often in heart health is, you know, is butter or margarine healthier? And really the answer to that would be margarine because it's made of a blend of unsaturated plant oils. So it does not raise our cholesterol, whereas butter is a saturated fat and it does. So any of those like soft kind of tub margarines are a good choice to have. Um, and so as far as sodium, so salt or sodium, they're interchangeable. Um, but these have quite a connection to lung health directly. And we know that sodium or salt can cause fluid retention. It makes our body hold on to more water. And this can make breathing more difficult. It can also increase our blood pressure. And we know that high blood pressure increases risk of heart disease and stroke. Um, and something to note is that the majority of Canadians do eat too much salt. And the amount we're allowed is really quite low. So it's 2,300 milligram daily or one teaspoon of salt. So it's not very much. And so where salt comes from, um, the majority of salt is actually found in processed or restaurant foods. And so if you're buying a processed food and it's got a label on it, it's always a good idea to read the label and try to find one that's got a bit less sodium in it. So you're aiming for less than 15% of your daily value. Um, and really some other things you can do is like cook or prepare more foods at home, try to choose unprocessed foods as much as possible, you know, eating more fresh or frozen vegetables. If you're getting um, canned or processed foods, trying to look for ones that are low sodium, sodium reduced, or no salt added. And you can always experiment with other seasonings like garlic, onions, ginger, lemon, herbs, spices. There's really lots of variety out there beyond salt. Um, and as well, like removing the salt shaker from the table can definitely be a useful thing too. Um, and as far as reducing sodium intake, our taste buds are able to adapt over time. So even if you start just kind of slowly cutting back, you will get used to that and you're still going to find your food flavorful and tasty. So you just have to kind of give it time and trust the process, but it's definitely worth kind of trying to limit your salt as much as possible, especially from kind of that lung health side of things. So sugar is another one that we talk about and sugar is found in many foods and it can be there naturally or it can be added. And really the goal is to avoid those added sugars. So to our body, all sugar is sugar. No one type is healthier than another. So you might see sugar you know, as the form of glucose or sucrose or honey or maple syrup, really none of those is any healthier than another in the fact that our body process them, processes them all the same way. So I know I've had some patients and diabetes who are like, oh, well, I switched from sugar to honey thinking they've, you know, made this good choice for their health, but it actually really is not any different to our bodies. Um, and if you're reading a label wondering about added sugars, ingredients are listed by quantity. So the higher up it is in the ingredient list, the more of it tends to be in a food. So trying to find foods where it's lower down is definitely a good choice. And we know that eating too much sugar is associated with heart disease, stroke, obesity, diabetes, high cholesterol, cancer, and even cavities. Um, and then hydration. So being well hydrated is really important as well for lung health because it helps to keep the mucus a bit more thin and it makes it easier for us to clear our airways. But the recommended um, fluid intake is quite individual and it depends on your body size, what medications you're on, um, you know, how well your kidneys work, what other medical conditions you have. Um, but on average, people tend to need kind of a minimum of six to eight cups of fluids per day. So that adds up to about kind of two liters. 
And really how you can tell if you're drinking enough fluid is by looking at the color of your urine. So it should be like a light pale yellow in color. It doesn't need to be clear. And I know I've heard that a lot that urine should be clear, but it actually doesn't need to be. That often means that you might have had a bit too much fluid in it. Um, as well, like your mouth should be moist. And if you are, you know, needing to track how much fluid you're having or you have a fluid restriction, perhaps um, any liquids are going to count towards that total fluid intake. So coffee, tea, soups, you name it, those all count. Um, and really water is the best source of hydration out there. Um, as far as supplements, so there's not any specific guidance as far as those with asthma or COPD, but there are some that come up quite a bit and we generally recommend people be taking. So vitamin D is one of those. And really this applies to anyone who's living in um, somewhere kind of northern, especially in the winter time, because our bodies are able to synthesize vitamin D from the sun, but we need a certain temperature for that reaction to occur. So during the winter months, and typically in Kamloops or most of BC, this would be from kind of like October until April, May, it's too cold for us to make vitamin D in our skin. So we actually do recommend taking a supplement kind of during those months. And if you live somewhere farther north that's a bit colder, you might need to take a supplement longer. Um, and so the recommended intake for those under 70 years old for vitamin D, a minimum would be 600 IU or international units per day. And if you're over 70 years of age, it's 800 international units per day. And then kind of a specific to like COPD and asthma is, you know, if you're using oral steroids or you're on them long term, so um, this would be like prednisone or something similar, there is a much higher risk of developing osteoporosis. And as a result, you need a bit more vitamin D and a bit more calcium. And this typically is more with longer term steroid use more than say a couple of weeks. Um, but yeah, so you would want to have somewhere in the realm of 800 to 2000 international units of vitamin D per day, um, especially if you're chronically on a steroid, you certainly would want to use that. And even if you're on like five milligrams, which is a pretty low dose, but if you're on that consistently for more than a couple weeks, you would want to be taking a bit more vitamin D. And then calcium is the other one that you'd want a bit more of just to help reduce your risk of osteoporosis with steroid use. Um, so the recommendation is to aim for about 1200 milligrams of calcium per day. And you can do this through a combination of food and supplements. So if you're someone who has a lot of dairy products and, you know, is able to get that calcium through diet, perfect. But if not, you can definitely supplement. Um, and like a lot of the milk alternatives these days are fortified with calcium. So you would be able to get some through that if you don't have dairy, um, but you would likely need to take a supplement just to get that kind of 1200 milligrams. Um, and the upper limit is 2000 milligrams per day. So you don't want to exceed that amount. Um, and then another one is vitamin B12. So a lot of kind of authorities around health really feel that vitamin B12 should be taken for those over 50 years of age. Um, and it's because our absorption of it just tends to decrease as we get older. And then certain medications put us at more risk for having a low B12 or if we're following a vegetarian diet because the best sources of B12 would be meat. Um, and then eggs has a bit and dairy has some. So if you're following a more vegetarian diet, it would be a great idea to get your B12 checked. And then just generally, if you find as you're getting older, your appetite's getting a bit less, it wouldn't be a bad idea to get that tested. And if it is low, then definitely a supplement is a great idea. Um, and I did a bit of a literature review through the natural medicines database, and there aren't any supplements that are proven to be helpful for COPD or asthma. Um, so I read a few studies, like one on concentrated pomegranate juice that didn't really show any good benefits. Um, you know, I've heard of people taking omega-3s and 
you know, for heart health, that can certainly be a good thing. And it helps kind of with a bit of inflammation, but there's no good evidence showing that it's helpful for COPD or asthma. Um, I've also heard of one called NAC or N-acetylcysteine. So these are ones that you certainly could ask your doctor about, but there isn't any like super strong or convincing evidence that, you know, they're needed or helpful for COPD or asthma. Um, and then just kind of some special things to know. So people with COPD do tend to have higher protein and energy or calorie needs. And this really depends on kind of like where you are at in your disease and how well controlled it is and how well you're able to breathe. So if it's a lot of effort for you to breathe, then, you know, oftentimes you do need a bit more nutrition because your body's working so hard to do that. And that would mean that you just need a bit more protein, a bit more calories. Um, as well, we know that overeating can produce extra CO2 and this is, or carbon dioxide, which um, we need to expel through breathing out. Um, so, you know, being cautious that, you know, you're eating just to where you're full, you're not overeating that. Um, and knowing that, you know, those fullness signals from our stomach to our brain, they take about 20 minutes to get from the stomach to the brain. So it can be a really good idea to like take your time, eat slowly, and then kind of sit and wait a little bit, perhaps before deciding to go for seconds. Um, because yeah, we don't want you to be overeating and kind of making it a bit harder for yourself. And there is some evidence to show that lower carbohydrate or lower sugar diets can help make it easier to breathe in patients with COPD. And that's because there's less of that carbon dioxide produced. But generally, if you're following that kind of healthy plate model and you're having lots of fruits and vegetables, a bit of protein, a bit of carbohydrate foods, then you're not going to exceed that amount and it's not going to make any difference. It's more if you're eating like a very, very high, mostly kind of carbohydrate, high sugar diet that you might want to consider talking to your doctor and or getting a referral to a dietitian to talk about that. Um, and if you are someone who does tend to retain a lot of CO2, then it might be a good idea to talk to your, your healthcare team and see if there's anything you can do to help with that. Um, and it may or may not be kind of related to your diet. Um, and then as far as like milk or dairy, um, I know I've definitely heard from patients that, you know, they have heard that having milk or dairy increases mucus production, but there isn't really good evidence that it does. But this is something that tends to be a bit individual. So if you feel that it increases your, your mucus and it's easier for you to breathe without it, then for sure cut it out. But do make sure you're getting that calcium and those nutrients from another source instead. Um, and then as well, just that note, COPD itself and taking those oral steroids or prednisone can increase your risk of osteoporosis. So again, very good idea to talk to your doctor about a vitamin D and calcium supplement. And as far as those kind of on inhaled steroids, so maybe people with asthma or COPD, we know that those do pose a lower risk of causing osteoporosis, but there definitely is some risk with long-term exposure of high doses of orals or of inhaled steroids over several years. So again, may or may not be a good idea just to take some vitamin D and calcium to make sure you're kind of hitting those numbers and preventing it. But yeah, it's not a place that we have good research, unfortunately. So that kind of covers all the main things I wanted to talk about today. Um, do we have any questions? Thank you. Oh, one question. <clears throat> Go ahead, anyone that has a question. Mm -hmm. Okay, B12, what are your yeah. numbers on B12? Yeah, like how much should you take? Yeah, how much should you take? Yeah, um, so pills typically come in either a thousand microgram or 250 microgram doses. Um, so for most people taking a thousand micrograms is perfectly safe. Um, it is always, oh, sorry. Great, that's good. Okay, and it, it is always a good idea if you have a doctor to get your B12 level tested, just to make sure that, you know, you do actually need the supplement. Um, but that said, there's not really any harm in having too much B12. It just might add an unnecessary pill. Thank you. Um, I have a question. 
Um, mm -hmm. You had mentioned inhaled um, in the inhaled um, puffers. Yeah. Um, inhaled, like as in the Respimat, Spiriva Respimat. Yeah, that would be one of them, or else like Simbacort, Pulmacort, like any of those kind of inhaled steroids okay. like that. And that one's hard because we just, there's not, there's not good research on that, but like, like, I mean, I myself, I've been on Simbacort since I was 14 years old. So, you know, I kind of wonder, cause I'm going to be on it a very long time, like what that's going to do. And, you know, there isn't good research, whether it does increase risk of osteoporosis, but I think just to be on the safe side, it would not be a bad idea to take a vitamin D supplement. And for most people over the winter months, taking a thousand international units is a safe dose. And that's kind of a typical dose that pills will come in. Okay. Now oh, yeah. speaking of vitamin D also, mm -hmm. um, what type of vitamin C? Cause there's different, mm -hmm. um, different. Yeah, there are different forms. Um, usually the like pill you'd want to take is vitamin D3. Okay. Mm -hmm. And is it, um, I think I read somewhere that it's better absorbed when taken with magnesium. Um, I can't remember now. Mm. Um, yeah. So vitamin D is fat soluble. So absorption is going to help if you have it with a meal that's got some fat in it. Okay. Um, but it tends to absorb pretty well, even if you don't. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. And then I see there's a question in the chat. Um, how much is too much liquids? I have at least eight cups of fluid. Um, that was no. Rita's question. Yeah. No, I have, sorry, I have at least a minimum of eight glasses and one glass is more than a cup. Mm. It's, oh, it's, it's, a about, more. it's nearly a cup and a half. Yeah. A glass is about a cup and a half or two cups, maybe, depending mm -hmm. on the glass sites. And you're having eight of those. Yeah, and everything that I take into measure, the, the tea, the coffee, mm -hmm. other liquids that I have, milk or whatever, soy milk, no. Mm -hmm. What are the dangers of having too much liquid? Yeah, so the dangers really in people with, you know, COPD and asthma is that you might retain some extra fluid on your body and then it's going to be harder to breathe and get that off. But most people who have like normally functioning kidneys and, you know, this really depends on if, you know, you have heart failure, heart problems or not. But for most people, like going a bit over that, there's not going to be any, any problems with it. It's more if you're someone who tends to retain fluid, maybe you get some swelling in your ankles or your feet um those are the people that really want to watch how much fluid they're having and so that would be people with kind of kidney issues could also be people who have heart failure so you know as long as you find that you're not kind of retaining that fluid on your body anywhere it's not making it harder to breathe um mm -hmm. i wouldn't worry too much about having a bit more um yeah, it shouldn't be a problem for most people, but it's kind of specifically if you've been given like a fluid restriction or a total fluid intake you want to aim for in a day, which, you know, some people I've seen restricted to as low as just a liter of fluid a day. But if you don't have anything like that, you don't have any of these other conditions, then I really wouldn't worry too much. I would just kind of drink based on your thirst and how you're feeling. So if, um, if, if you're drinking a lot of fluid and going to pee a lot mm -hmm. does that compensate also if you're exercising getting enough activity then yeah. how does all that correlate yeah so you're right that exercise certainly plays a role here too and especially if you're someone who happens to sweat quite a lot because that's you know another way that we do lose fluid um so they would all be kind of pieces of the puzzle and Kamloops is quite dry. I'm not sure if you're here or not, but, you know, I find myself a lot more thirsty here than say when I'm on the coast in Vancouver. Um, so, I mean, it, it all kind of plays a role um, or if it's really, really hot, like, you know, you're definitely going to end up having a bit more fluid because you're going to need it. Um, so I, I really wouldn't worry too much unless you notice kind of any of those things that I mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just Janine asked a question, or Janice, 
Janine. Janice asked a question just about um, the Spiriva recipe mat. There is no inhaled steroid in the Spiriva recipe mat. Um, it is a different classification of medication. So the concern about osteoporosis from inhaled steroids, you don't have that concern with the Spiriva recipe mat. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, I think it's okay. mostly like Simbacort, Pulmacort, those Pulmacort, kind of Any of the inhaled steroids. And yeah. there are new medications that are what we call triple therapy that are coming out with combinations mm. of that. Um, so it's always smart to, um, and generally your pharmacist can be the best source of information with your medication to ask what is actually in the medication. So then you know the different types that you may be taking, right? And if they're appropriate for you or not. Mm -hmm. And you can ask that of your respirologist or any healthcare practitioner, practitioner excuse me. Uh, next question, Kira, you want to take it on? Yeah, sure. So the question is, what would you recommend for snacks for winter time up north where there's not much fresh fruits and veggies are frozen just as good? Yes. Yes, they are. So frozen fruits and veggies can be a really good option, especially in the winter time if there isn't much fresh that's available to you. Um, they're just as healthy, like typically frozen fruit, there's nothing added to it. They just freeze it. Um, same with vegetables, but you can always look at the packaging and read the ingredients just to make sure of that. Um, but yeah, frozen is just as good and it has obviously a longer shelf life. You know, you don't have to worry that you bought all this lettuce that you're not going to eat. Um, so they're definitely just as good options and they can be a lot more cost effective. So, you know, if you're wanting to do like some fruit as snacks, frozen definitely works. Absolutely. One thing to, um, on top of that, I read recently that, um, cause I was curious about that cause my daughter likes to eat tons of fruit and, you know, paying $10 for the smallest thing of blueberries. Yeah. Is outrageous. <laughs> um, but there are a lot of studies that have come out that shown that when fruits like blueberries and those types of berries, when they're picked, they're technically frozen right away. So they have the same antioxidant levels was what's usually what you're wanting from <clears throat> those fruits and vegetables. Um, so you, yeah, fruit's usually not, um, when it's frozen, it's frozen right as it's picked. So you're yeah. not losing all those, the nutritional value that you're wanting out of it. So, um, maybe looking into over the winter time when it's not in season, you know, Costco has those big bags are usually always on sale might be worth, you know, using those adding into a smoothie or something like that to get those extra fruit and vegetables in. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And even like frozen vegetables can be a good option too. Like if you're having a smoothie or you're having a stew or something, like they work just as well. Um, or even if like you had some spinach or kale or lettuce that you didn't eat, you can always just chuck it in the freezer and then like put a little bit in a smoothie and it's not really going to change the flavor very much. So there's lots of ways to use them. Um, hide it in there. <laughs> yeah, just get it. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, we had uh, a question sent in before, excuse me, um, the presentation today, and it was from Maggie regarding um, days waking up feeling bloated and at times nauseated in the morning. Is there any literature about what may cause this? Yeah, that's a hard one because it, it really depends on kind of your own medical situation and if there are any other conditions going on. Um, I mean, it, it's definitely not unusual to get some bloating after eating, but, you know, waking up in the morning with it might be a little bit unusual. Um, I mean, some main things you can do to kind of help with that is like, you know, make sure that you're having bowel movements regularly. That can certainly help. Make sure that you're, you know, eating a good amount of fiber. So you've got some fruits and vegetables in there. You've got some whole grains. Making sure that you're staying hydrated can kind of help move things through. Even doing a bit of moving around sometimes helps to settle it. Um, yeah, but if it's been a long-standing problem or it's getting worse or there's something like that, it, it really would be a good idea to bring that up to your doctor and see if, you know, there's any investigations that they might recommend doing and perhaps they'd want to send you to a gastroenterologist or a GI specialist to look into it a bit more. And especially if you find it's really impacting like how much you can eat and if you're losing weight, that's, you know, certainly a concern. So, um. Yeah, I would definitely suggest talking with your doctor about it and just, you know, making sure there's nothing too scary going on. And then perhaps they could refer you to a specialist or even refer you to a dietitian and, 
yeah, hopefully someone can help you with that a bit more. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> These are such great questions. Um, and then Jeannie Tom just wanted to let everyone know, uh, I guess this was experienced, folks with pulmonary hypertension may have a daily fluid restriction to reduce the edema in their lower limbs. So that might be one patient population that might actually experience that if um, that's you, but there are so many different people. Uh, Kira, I think there was one more question yes. in, but I can't find it. I was hoping you- On the email, let me, let me pull it up. Okay. I know I've got it somewhere. Okay, the question is, currently my diet consists of GF, so I think that's gluten-free, DF, so I think dairy-free, anti-inflammatory, low sugar, plus poultry, fish, veggie-based proteins. I've discovered lactose-free cheese, which I'm enjoying as a protein as well. Are there specific foods in addition to my current diet? i.e. olive oil, blueberries, et cetera, or a food group to avoid or increase? That is a good question. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a very good diet. Um, I think really like if you're restricting things like a full food group or going dairy free or gluten free, like, you know, do make sure that you do actually need to do that because we don't want you to be avoiding foods that are that are good for you and have lots of nutrition to them. Um, so, you know, if you are gluten free, make sure that you're still getting those, you know, that fiber and the whole grain from other sources, maybe it's more oatmeal or bran buds or quinoa, things like that, like make sure that you're not kind of missing that that food group um and then same with the dairy free like make sure that there is another way that you're getting some calcium um but really no there's nothing specific that I would say you need to add I would just make sure that you're not kind of unnecessarily restricting food um and yeah, like there's nothing wrong with lots of fruits and vegetables. So, you know, if you like blueberries and you want to have more of them, absolutely go for it. Um, and then as far as like kind of the olive oil, I mean, it definitely, it's a healthy oil to cook with if you're doing kind of lower temperature food or it can work well in a salad dressing. So it's definitely one of the healthier oils to choose. Um, avocado oil is also a good one if you're cooking because it can withstand a higher temperature, higher smoke point. Um, but it, it sounds like a pretty great diet. So I, I would not be too worried about any specifics there. Wow, that was a great answer. Um, I, I hope whoever sent that question in um, that it satisfied your question. If not, please um, add in more questions into the chat box if you feel like you want a bit more information. Um, that's it for questions that were sent in in the chat box. Does anyone else have any burning questions? I have like kind of something I just wanted to add, not like add, but I have a kind of a question. So one thing um, from teaching the pulmonary function or the pulmonary rehab program in the past, I'd always get clients saying like, how do I increase my protein, especially for COP and for the empyzematous types of patients. And I always kind of struggle to kind of find like ways to incorporate it. Um, one thing recently that I started um, kind of drinking. Um, and I wasn't sure if this is something that you've kind of heard about is more bone broths and adding that into diets. Mm -hmm. Is that something that would be recommended to like patients with COPD or asthma? Yeah, you could definitely use that if you wanted to as kind of a source of a bit more protein. Um, I don't, I'm not super familiar with bone broths. I'm actually vegetarian, so I don't know those super <laughs> well. And it is but, a weird thing I think that's on like kind of yeah. come out. Um, I kind of brought yeah. it up for, this, for this one PowerPoint. So I found this one in mm. Superstore. They're mm. all different. So they all have a different Ooh. amount of protein yeah. in them. But this one at Superstore has 15 grams. Oh, nice. Protein. So yeah. you drink them in the packet, you get 15 grams of protein. Other ones you have to kind of watch because there are other things like mm -hmm. added oils and that kind of stuff that you might not yeah. want. Or like sodium, I would think of. Yeah. So yeah. I, ha I have seen a couple at Save On. I've looked at the package. And I'm like, there's a lot of added stuff to it. And they didn't have as high of protein content. But um, it's always been something that I've been struggling to try to find mm -hmm. people who ask me, but yeah, you know, I'm not sure if that's something that yeah, I, I think that would definitely not be a bad idea to try like you could even use it like as a soup base or something mm -hmm. if you're wanting to just to get a bit more protein than you would from like a usual broth even that might be a good use for it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because that's this is something we talk about like in diabetes a lot because we want people to pair all their meals and all their snacks with, you know, a source of protein. So really it's, you know, 
trying to find ones that you like and that are easy to eat. And for some people, adding in things like a protein powder to a smoothie can be helpful or oatmeal or like that can be a way to get more in. Um, you can also use like nuts, seeds, nut butters. Um, Greek yogurt is a great source of protein. So is cottage cheese. Um, tofu is another really good one that's quite inexpensive and it's quite easy to use. Like if you really just Google or look up tofu recipes, there'll be tons of good ones that come up. So that's a nice like inexpensive protein to use. Beans, lentils, those kind of things can be great proteins as well. So it's just kind of, yeah, finding ways for you to fit it in. Um, soy milks are good, dairy milks are good. You can even buy something called um, ultra filtered milk. And one of the brands is like Joya, it's J-O-Y-Y-A. And they're basically milks where they just kind of remove some of the extra liquid off. So they end up being like closer to 18 to 20 grams of protein per cup. So that can be a great way to add some more in. Um, yeah, so there's there's lots and lots of options for sure as far as protein and if it would be helpful like after the presentation I can always send um, like some resources for you guys to send out to the participants just about protein sources because I know that that can be challenged for everyone. Yeah. Is, that yeah. bone, is that bone broth available uh, easily available and is it a, in liquid form or is it a powder that you add liquid too. Great question. So I've been trying a bunch of different ones to find the ones I like. So I'm on the hunt for the best one. This one, I'm going to put it in the chat box. I got it from Superstore down that healthy aisle. Um, so I'll put the it in the chat box. You can get it in just the naked and they have other flavors like lemon ginger, which is mm. what I'm going to try the next. Um, mm. I felt like I had to like ground a little bit of salt in it, to be honest. Like this one, I felt there was no salt. So it doesn't hurt to add a little bit. So I've just put a little bit in, but it just tastes like you're drinking the, the end of a soup. Um, mm -hmm. But this one I found had the most amount of protein. So this is 15 grams of protein and it's just, you boil some water and you pour the package in. Oh, okay. um, other ones that I'm trying, not as much of a fan, but you can get them at Save On and those types of places too that are in a liquid form. Yeah. But um yeah, this one has added sugar to it. So I'm not the biggest fan of that. And mm. it's not as high in protein um, as the other ones. I think this was only nine grams for a cup. So just kind of have to look around, reach, um, kind of figure out what one you like the best. Um, but, but it's I not, taste that one it's better, not but... in, the, uh, in the soup uh, aisle. No, it'll be in the health food aisle. Okay, thank you. Yeah, in and uh, we'll get Alexa to put the name in the chat box. Yeah, and in Savon, it's like in the cracker aisle, but there's like a random like little health yeah. little section yeah. in there. Okay. Um, so everywhere it's gonna have it. It's pretty much where you find your chicken broths are gonna be. It'll just say bone broth, and you can get different types of bone broth. You can do chicken. There's beef. There's different forms. So just kind of try them out to see ones you like. Mm -hmm. uh, but that one at Superstore is actually pretty tasty. And I love that it had the yeah. grams of protein for one cup. So I'll uh, put that in the chat box right yeah. here. But that'd be great. Look, it's a good way to, um, I think, what did I make the other day? I made a soup the other day, a, a ramen, and I just added it to it because mm -hmm. it called for chicken broth. So I was like, put some that and add some protein to it. So there you go. Yeah. Thanks, Lance. Perfect. Yeah, that's a great source of protein. And I see we kind of, Pulled up a few more questions. questions. Yeah. yeah. So people wondering about like protein drinks or meal replacement, things like that. So they oh, certainly yeah. can be um a healthy part of a diet. Absolutely. Like, you know, sometimes if you don't have much of an appetite, but you feel it easier to drink things, then you know, a meal replacement drink can be a great idea. And something like Ensure or Boost are quite good ones because they've got lots of protein and, you know, they've got some vitamins and minerals to them too. So, you know, especially like if you're someone who's quite short of breath and you're really finding it hard to, you know, to be able to eat and chew, sometimes drinking things can be a lot easier. So those are definitely a safe option. Um, and then there was a question about whey protein. Yeah, that's definitely a safe source of protein. Um, and there's lots of different kind of protein powders out there these days. Like there's whey, there's soy, there's 
um, pea protein or the more plant-based kind of ones. And really it's quite individual like you just pick the one that you like the taste of and that kind of feels good for you so there's no one that's like better than another um so someone had kind of said finding that protein powders upset their stomach so yeah I would just definitely try say try a different kind of kind of it so if you had a whey protein maybe try a different one um and there is a company called Manitoba Harvest that makes actually like some hemp protein powders and they're produced in Canada and they're a really good option and you can buy like pretty small canisters if you're wanting to just try it rather than committing to like a huge container of it um, and you can get some that have fiber in them too so they're they're a really good option and I like them quite a bit in smoothies because they don't add any flavor um, but yeah it's, it's really whichever kind of protein powder you like and that works for you is is a good one to take a lot of like really nice. places like Popeyes and stuff, if you want to try them out, they can give you samples mm. too. If you don't want to commit to buying like a $90 one, yeah. but a lot of those um, the other companies, like, they have like little packages of trying samples. So it's worth, especially if you're going to commit to spend that much money on a yeah. thing, you can try it out first. So they're pretty Absolutely. good. Absolutely. Wonderful. I think that's all the questions. I think you kind of answered two or three questions in in one response, which I think was great. Um, we've got just a few more minutes left. If there's any other questions that might've popped up just through the discussion, um, the presentation will be posted shortly afterwards. So it will be up for you to review. Um, so yes, any other questions from anybody else? Um, I had a question. Mm -hmm. And what's your name? Uh, Sam. Sam, wonderful. Um, I, um, it was about the uh, back at the beginning about frequency of, of meals and stuff and a suggestion four to five hours. Um, I have um, often uh, extended uh, the time, like I have very, very late breakfast, really close to lunchtime mm -hmm. to um, give my a weight loss or a weight control thing. Um, and I'm just wondering what's the pros and cons of doing that in terms of my nutrition. Yeah, good question. So you're kind of referring to like an intermittent fasting style of eating or time restricted eating, it sounds like. Time, re time restricted yeah. eating, yes. Yeah, so there's lots of research showing that that can be a helpful strategy of weight loss if, if that's what you're going for. Um, the things to watch out for is just to make sure that you are kind of getting enough of the foods you need if you're only having a few meals per day. Um, and then the other thing to consider is, you know, sometimes when we go really long periods without eating, it ends up making us a more hungry and more likely to overeat later on during times when we kind of allow ourselves to eat. So for some people that can be a really good strategy because you've kind of got this enforced time period where you can eat. So then you're less likely to say mindlessly snack in the evening or things like that. So it, it certainly can be helpful. Um, but I've also seen people where they just end up starving and end up overeating during kind of that eating window. So it really depends on kind of each person individually and what works for them. But, um, you know, as long as you feel good doing that and you're not becoming kind of like starving or overly hungry in between your meals and you, you know, you're happy doing it, then by all means continue. It definitely can be helpful for weight loss. It's yeah, it's everything's kind of quite individual. Thank you. Okay. I think the last thing we have to do is remind people of our next webinar. Yes. So everyone, December 14th, so little less than a month away, we're going to be, Alex and I will be presenting about respiratory medications. So learning about your meds and more. Um, so that is on the 14th. It's a little sooner just to give a break for the holiday season. So um, don't forget to register for that. And uh, we hope to see your happy little faces there. Thank you so much, Kira. This was great. I, I learned so much. I hope everybody else was able to take away quite a bit of information. Alexa did post the name of that bone broth, which actually now I want soup. So let's see how that goes. Okay. Awesome. Well, Thanks for having me. Thank you so thank, much. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, um, sorry, Barbara. On the 14th, it'll be at 2 p.m. again. So same time, just a week sooner. Hmm. 
Okay. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, you have very a much.